Yeah, come on, let's give it up for these guys. Who is feeling good now? You guys feeling good? You feeling a little joy in your life right now? I'll tell you what, um, let me tell you why we're doing this. We're, we're doing this whole idea of talking about joy because I think we all want more happiness in our life, don't we? I think we want more, anybody want more happiness in their life? Do you guys want more, more joy and happiness? And I think even when we come into these spaces like this, I think so many times, um, you know, we think, oh man, people want to know the character of God. I think that might be the case. I think a lot of times we want to come into this space and go, man, is this going to make me happier? Am I going to have a better life as a result of, you know, kind of exploring and pursuing Jesus? So uh, we're excited you're here. There's a lot of things that bring us joy. In fact, one thing that brings us a lot of joy is game day. Who's excited for game day next weekend? Come on, let's try this again. All right, next weekend, uh, just as uh, we heard a moment ago, uh, Sunday only, and we want to bring our online community and our in-person community together. We're going to do that, and so uh, the following weekend, we'll be back on Thursday nights and Sundays, but next weekend, Sunday only, we hope to see you there. Now, another thing for me that brings me joy is uh, sports, games. Um, I used to play a lot of golf. I don't play golf as much as I used to, Um, but this was something that always brought me joy. Um, anybody, anybody want a ball? Anybody want to, I, can we just do this in here for a moment? You guys ready over here? All right, here we go. Here you go. Oh, man, like right in his lap. How about that? Anybody else want a, want a shot right here? Oh, let's see. See, this brought me joy. I mean, I used to play golf every single day as a student uh, into my college years, sometimes twice a day. Uh, brought me a lot of joy. And then I'd shank stuff like that, and I still, you know, it's a good day. A good day on the golf course is better than a, a horrible day, a, a good day at work, right? So um, there's a lot of things that create joy in our lives, and we're going to talk about that today. Uh, my name's Kurt. If we haven't had a chance to meet, it's great to meet you. And uh, for those tuning in online, so good to have you join us. Let's make noise for those who are uh, joining us online. So good to have you join us. If you're here for the first time online in our seats, man, we hope it's the first of many times. And today, I don't really have like three, you know, linear points. I'm not going to give you like three bam, bam, bam points. Um, I'm going to give you one big idea. And, and the big idea is this. It's, it's something that the Apostle Paul tells us. He says, all things are possible through Christ, Jesus, who gives me strength, who strengthens me. And we're going to talk about that. And we're going to talk a bit about what that looks like. Um, as we have some fun. And uh, before we do that, in fact, uh, let me just pray for us. Um, Heavenly Father, we pray that in this moment, um, we would have some fun. You created us for fun, for enjoyment, and I just pray that your joy would infuse our lives and your grace would wash over our lives and, and we would experience you. And as we go out of this place, we would have some new tools and new awareness of what you're doing around us. And, and God, I just pray that my words um, would be helpful. The things we do in, this, in these moments would be beneficial. And uh, it'd be helpful for all your family and, and every single one of us who may be taking a step into your family as a result of our time today. So thank you. Thank you. Amen. So uh, let me tell you how this idea of this thing Paul says, you know, I can do all things through Christ who gives, who strengthens me, how this connects to joy. Um, The thing about this verse right here um, that's really kind of crazy is it's not true. (laughs) It's not true. In fact, um, at least it's not true in the sense that most of us interpret it and take it and, and try to live it out. And and what I mean by that is, you know, most people read this verse, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And they go, man, that means I can do whatever I want to do. That means I can, if I put my mind to it, then it's going to happen. And, you know, I'm just here to tell you that that is absolutely not true. I mean, you cannot (laughs) just put your mind to something and all of a sudden, bam, you're going to have that kind of life. I mean, I wish that was the case, but I'm here to tell you that, that you're, you're, you're wrong on that. That just doesn't work that way. That might be a shocker to some of us, all right? Uh, for example, I, I used to play a lot, a lot of golf. I mean, I, I don't play nearly the way I used to. I might play sometimes two times a day, every day of the week. And, and it didn't matter if I was nine or 19. We, you know, if somebody said, man, Curry, you're pretty good. I mean, you're, you, you know, you could make the, the PGA. Um, you know, I, I would look at them and go, yeah, I, I don't know that I really could. I don't know that I'm quite that good. And you, you might say, but what about that verse right there? I can do all things. I can do anything that I put my mind to through Jesus, through Christ who gives me strength. And, 
And see, here's the problem. Here's why that doesn't work when it comes to this. You know, because I don't have the muscle fibers that a PGA golfer has. I, I have not developed, I, I used to play a lot of baseball, so I have a lot of remnants of baseball in my swing that I've never worked out of in the golf course. And honestly, I just don't have the hand-eye coordination that, you know, somebody that, that is on the pro tour has. And so as much as I try and I practice, it will just never, never come about. And so again, we look at this verse, we say, okay, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Okay, so what does that mean? What is this verse? Well, the point of this verse is actually joy. That's what I want us to see. I want to see the point of this verse, regardless of the circumstances you might be in right now, um, you can have joy. Now, the Apostle Paul, who writes this, this is a guy who, if you're newer to church, um, you're kind of like, yeah, I'm not really sure about church, not sure about Jesus, I'm here trying to figure it out. Um, you would probably like Paul. Yeah, check out Paul, because Paul was not into Jesus either, at least in his early life. And then one day, he had a change of mind. He totally changed his mind, and, and he began to follow Jesus. And so he tells us and teaches us what this looks like. And so he has this next phrase that we see him talk about when it comes to joy, and he says this. He says, rejoice in the Lord always, I say it again, rejoice. Rejoice in the Lord always, I say it again, rejoice. Now, um, for those of us who might have some church background, which is me, for one, um, you know, I grew up going to this thing called Vacation Bible School. I went to it as a kid, and I learned these songs. You may have learned some of these songs, too, and one of them was this verse right here. And it said, rejoice in the Lord always, again, I say, See, you got, some of you guys like learn that one too, right? And, and you know, we're not gonna sing it. So, you know, you might go, well, we could do this in rounds. I mean, we could all each sing a part of it. Yeah, we're not gonna do that, just, you know. Um, but I do wanna break this verse down for us for a moment. Like, what, what does this mean right here? Rejoice in the Lord. Well, what Paul's talking about right here is he's saying, hey, this doesn't mean, you know, rejoice in the way your life is going. Because see, your, your my, life may not be going in a way that you want. This doesn't mean, you know, rejoice in the way that, you know, and just kind of ignore everything going on around you and be all Pollyanna and be like, no, 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 I'm gonna ignore all the bad stuff going on in my life. It's not what it's talking about either. No, the truth is, you know, even as we like look around our country right now, um, there's a lot of things in our country that aren't going necessarily in the way that are trending in a good direction. And, and I'm not talking, you know, like politics or the economy. I'm talking things like emotionally and spiritually. So how, like, how do we find joy in this? You know, there's this thing called the um, World Happiness Report. And it, it came out earlier this year. It comes out every single year. There actually is such a thing. And this is where I want to ask you to take your devices out for a moment because um, this is interesting to me. You know, we dropped two spots from two years ago. Um, we've gone down. And I'm just interested in knowing where you think we may be on this spectrum. So um, we're going to take a poll. If you take your device out and just scan this code right here, um, it'll take you to a poll, and you can just kind of skip through putting your info in. And then I I'm interested in knowing, I want you to pick what do you think we came in at on the World Happiness Report, all right? Because we're apparently, you know, the wealthiest country in the history of the world. We're, you know, the most prosperous country. We're supposed to be the place of the most equal opportunity. Um, where do you think we came? Uh, it's interesting. You Look at that. That thing is changing. It's going up and down. And uh, you, you guys are spot on because you're feeling what most of the country's feeling. Guess where we came in? We came in 16th. 16th in the world in terms of happiness. Who beats us on this? Take a look at this list right here. Take a look at this list. Um, of course, all the, all the Norwegian countries, right? You expect that. Denmark, Finland. I mean, they're always like, eh, it's a great place to live. Iceland. Iceland came ahead. You know what's in Iceland? Snow, ice, and cold. That's what's in Iceland. I mean, you know, we, we've had like a mild winter here in Indianapolis, and, you know, we hear people grumbling, oh, I was over in cold outside. You know, we just grumble, and, you know, like that's all they have in Iceland is cold snow and ice. In fact, you know, the thing we've got that maybe they don't have is we have like weathermen and women who are in, co you know, kind of cahoots with Kroger, I think. I mean, Kroger's like, hey, tell everybody we're getting a snow getty, and, you know, we're getting two inches of snow, and everybody's like, Mildred, we gotta go. We gotta get batteries and melt. You know, and so the shelves are getting cleared off and we freak out, you know, because it's snowing. And listen, these people right here in Iceland, it snows all the time. And yet they're number three on the happiness report. Who else? I mean, Israel. Israel's number nine. Um, Canada. You know, Canada. I mean, they're, they're ahead of us, right? Like Canada, eh? <laughs> Like, what, what, what are they better than us at other than hockey? I mean, that's the only thing they're better than at, us at, right? Hockey. 
See, it's interesting. I think, I think we have an attitude problem here in the United States. I really do. I think, I think we have kind of been given this snow job where if we're kind of expecting this financial prosperity or the potential of financial prosperity, um, you know, kind of this dream life like we see on Instagram, I think, you know, I think we feel like, oh my gosh, we're, you know, we're, we're, we just lose our joy. We're not happy. In fact, the, the Atlantic Monthly actually uh, wrote an article on this recently. They said this. They said, we, you know, we don't get happier as our society gets richer because we chase the wrong things. We're promised happiness with the next pay raise, the next new gadget, even the next sip of soda. The Swedish business professor, Carl Seedstrom, he argues persuasively in his book, The Happiness Fantasy, that corporations and advertisers have promised satisfaction but have led people instead into a rat race of joyless production and consumption. Though the material comforts in this life in the U.S. have increased for many of us, it doesn't necessarily give life meaning. And we feel that, don't we? We feel that. We, we have more stuff. We have a higher standard of living. We have more gadgets. We have more accolades. None of this is wrong. We have all this stuff. And yet, you know, it, the data is really, really clear. I mean, if you're kind of buying in that, man, that stuff is going to make you happy, um, we just realize our joy is going down, down, down. It doesn't translate. See, there's a difference between happiness and joy. I mean, happiness, God created happiness. God created us to be happy. Um, anytime something good happens, we see something that warms our heart, we get happy, we get excited. I mean, it, it just makes us feel good. That's an amazing thing. We hope those things never stop. But the Apostle Paul says, yeah, but there's other parts of life too where we can still have something that's kind of equivalent, maybe even deeper. And he talks about something called joy, and it's based on God. He says, rejoice in the Lord always. He says, rejoice in, in, in the Lord, not, not rejoice in prosperity, and as long as things are going well, I'm going to rejoice, not rejoice in a good life, or when I get my own way, then I'm going to rejoice. He says, no, rejoice in the Lord, and how often does he say to do it? Always, yeah, he says, always. He says, no matter how bad my life is going, all right, regardless of what I'm experiencing, we have a God who's provided for us. We have a God who loves us. We have a God who actually came to this side of the equation, who, who came and, and, and experienced what you and I experience in life, who knows what's going on. And so he says, you know, that's the kind of God that we should, regardless of what we're experiencing, we should rejoice that we have somebody like that that understands us. See, this right here is a core operating principle of somebody who's following Jesus, the rejoicing all right, somebody who has a hard time rejoicing, let me tell you something, um, probably somebody who's having a hard time with God. Seattle Times, they wrote a, another interesting article, and this was interesting, this was a number of years ago before the pandemic, and uh, so this was before we're like hypersensitive to like, you know, the economy and inflation and what's that doing to us. They said this, they said, social science shows that Americans as a whole have found it harder to garner contentment, connection, and optimism during these prosperous years, and it has felt that way. The fluke of, of modernity is that it's called the, parody, uh, the prosperity paradox. Beyond the minimal levels of material security and means, human contentment and happiness has not increased in proportion to increased material well-being. Income, wealth, consumer options, luxury, and stuff, despite the statistics that prove humans have never had it so good, we don't feel so good. And I think that's true. We, we go around, we're like, I just don't feel good. And we have all these reasons around us to be optimistic and happy. And see, for those of us who align ourselves with Jesus, I mean, it's like we have the God of the universe who's actually doing amazing things in our midst. Even when things aren't going so good, there's so much still to celebrate. And yet, so many times, we don't even have to have a good attitude. We can just choose and say, you know, I'm going to choose it. I'm going to rejoice in the Lord. I'm going to choose to do what Jesus says, what Paul says. I'm going to rejoice in the Lord always. Now, the Apostle Paul, he goes on to something really kind of fascinating next he says, he says, let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. <laughs> now, it's pretty crazy. I don't know that reasonableness is a, a character trait that we really put high regard in. I mean, I don't know how many times you go around and say, who's reasonable in my life, um, right? How, how reasonable is our country right now? Yeah, this is one of the big parts of our faith right here, according to the Apostle Paul. And it's interesting because... Um, this doesn't mean you think like everybody else. This doesn't mean you're, you're, you're doing what everybody else is doing. No, it says you're reasonable. It says you, you use your brain, you use your brain and you operate and you say, okay, well, what's the reasonable thing to do right here? Which means when things are going pretty well, 
when I'm in a season where I'm like, yeah, things are going pretty well, the reasonable thing to do is go, oh my gosh, God, thank you. You are the provider of everything. All the things I'm experiencing, I just need to thank you. I need to rejoice in what you're doing, the things you're bringing my way. And I wanna appreciate that. I wanna, I wanna say, God, things are going pretty good. That, that's what it means to be reasonable. Now, I know for our younger generations right now, um, you know, our, our you know, teenagers, 20-somethings, I mean, you know, it, many times, many of this generation just feels inundated with stress and anxiety. And I could rapid fire all kinds of data at you that, that you know, kind of would show this, which we probably are aware, we see it. And, and for some reason, it's more than, you know, with them than it is perhaps older generations. And, and there's a lot of theories on this. Um, one of the reasons I think this is, is because they've been fed a lie. Their whole life, they've been fed a lie. They've been told, you know, man, you can do anything you want. I mean, you, you put your mind to it, you can do it. They were told, man, if you wanna, you know, go be in the PGA, I mean, if you can just hit a few good shots and, you know, whoo, uh, that, that was a little dangerous. <laughs> I'm sorry about that. Um, you know, then, then you can do it. And, and that is so not true. It's just, it just doesn't work that way. And, and now, you know, perhaps, you know, this generation, because we have access to social media and we see everybody's reels and we see what's going on in their lives, we go, oh my gosh, I see what other people are doing, I see their lives. I'm not maybe as far along as they are. I'm not measuring up to where they are. And for whatever reason, I mean, our younger generations, there's just more stress and more anxiety than any other generation. And when somebody's dealing with that, when I come alongside somebody, I'll usually say, hey, let's just think reasonably for a moment. When's the last time you were hungry? When's the last time you, you just absolutely didn't have anything to eat? I'm not talking like it's been a few hours. I'm like, you have zero access to food. When's the last time you just were completely naked, no clothes? Not like you didn't do your laundry, but like uh, you don't have any access to clothes. When, when was the last time that? When's the last time your house, you know, got hit by a ballistic missile? You know, because that's happening in our world right now. Um, you know, not here, but in parts of our world. And we realize we have more comforts, we have more insurance policies, we have more fail-safes in our country than we've ever had, and yet we're more stressed and more anxiety-ridden than any generation. See, I think one of the reasons on this is we have lost our ability to rejoice in the Lord, to say, oh my gosh, look what God has done and connect to the reality that he continues to be available and know what's going on and look over us in our lives. And so Paul he kind of goes on and he says, okay, so here's, here's kind of the next thing he'd suggest. He says, don't be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. So according to the Apostle Paul, what are, what are we encouraged to be anxious about? He says, do not be anxious about what? Anything. <laughs> he says, nothing. He says, don't, don't, don't be anxious about anything. This is actually a command. It's a command for your own good. All right, this, is, this isn't a suggestion. He says, don't be anxious about anything. But see, what happens when you and I, we're like, okay, what happens when I have a problem? When I have a problem, I go, oh my gosh, I don't know how I'm gonna handle this. What do we do? We go, oh, good, man. This is, this is like a license for me to be you know, anxiety-ridden. I can be stressed out now. I can go, oh my gosh, everybody's gonna understand why I'm so stressed out over this. You know, what, what does Paul say? He says, no, in every situation, by prayer and petition, making requests, like petitioning your heavenly Father, he says, you just present what's going on in your life to God. Talk to God about it. He's like, you know, when I'm anxious, I'm usually spending time thinking about myself, not thinking about God. When I'm anxious, I'm usually trying to forecast the future, and I'm beginning to think of all the negative and the bad and the difficulty that might come, instead of saying, oh my gosh, what, what might God do here that's totally outside my realm of like understanding or even considering? When I'm anxious, I'm just looking inward, inward, inward. I'm not considering what God is doing outside of me. Now, I, I get kind of passionate about this. If, you, if it kind of feels like I'm a little passionate on this, it is because it's accurate because I, like, I've been down this road. I've been on this road. And, and perhaps I'm just kind of like coaching myself. You know, it's just that anxiety, when I'm, when, I'm, when I'm feeling that anxiety, it's when I'm about myself instead of about God. See, when I'm thinking about God, I'm not thinking about myself. And, and when I'm not thinking about myself and how my life might, might not be going the direction or the way that I exactly planned, I don't get anxious. But see, when I do begin to think about myself and go, oh my gosh, this isn't all what I wanted and I, I'm getting stressed about it, all of a sudden, anxiety sets in. Now, I, I'm not saying, I'm not saying, you know, don't j just pay attention, you know, deny reality. I'm not saying that. 
I'm not saying, you know, just like put you know, earplugs in and be like, no, 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 I'm going to block it all out. All right, I'm going to take in no bad information. No, I'm not saying that at all. It's just that when bad information comes, when difficult information comes and I begin to feel bad, what, what Paul's saying is in that moment, shift your thinking and go, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna think about God. I'm gonna rejoice in him. In fact, I'm gonna, I'm gonna make a prayer out of this. This is what he says right here. I, I'm gonna go, okay, God, um, will you help me out right here with A, B, C, and D? I mean, could you help me on this? Because, because I know you know what's going on. And, and perhaps you've had a moment like this this week. You probably have. I've had moments like this this week where bad information's come my way. In fact, just as I was preparing for this week, I got bad information. I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm gonna put this into practice right now. I, I could fret about it. I could get all worked up and God, I don't know how you're gonna work this out. But you know, God, I'm gonna choose right now instead to go, I have no idea how you're gonna work this out, but I can't wait. I'm gonna rejoice in you that I have a heavenly father who knows and knows exactly what's needed. Because you and I, we have a heavenly father who gets us. He, he gets us. Have you seen these commercials on, on TV? Uh, these are fascinating. The he gets us commercials. Um, they, they've been playing you know, periodic, periodically over the last couple months. Um, if not, um, take a look at this. These are fascinating. A caring man took a walk. Everywhere he looked, people suffered. Anxiety ran high. Hope dwindled. Hatred rose. His neighbors had lost trust in the system and in each other. I need to do something, he thought. I'll bring them together and feed them. Around the dinner table, they can talk and see how much they have in common. Shared struggles, shared joy, shared pain. So he prepared a feast and invited all into his home. But some refused to sit at his table because they chose to only see differences. He was heartbroken because he wanted everyone to eat and be filled not with food and wine, but with compassion. You know, this is fascinating. Do you realize there's a $100 million campaign behind this, 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 this brand right here? I mean, it, it, it's a handful of guys, women, men that are just like, man, we want to we wanna rebrand the person of Jesus because a bunch of his followers have just totally destroyed his brand and, and really the, who, who Jesus is. I wouldn't even call them followers, people who I think think they're doing the right thing. And like, we got we to gotta rebrand that Jesus, he gets us. He's here for us. He's here for us. The point is he gets us. So what do we do when we get in these moments where we begin to feel the anxiety? Yeah, I've had it, you've had it. What do we do? I wanna give you, uh, I wanna give you a couple things to think about right here. Um, uh, three letters, T-E-A, all right? And, and, and I'm not, this, this isn't like tea, like go have a, a sip of Earl Grey or Lipton tea, that's not that. Um, these are three letters that represent three words that help us understand why we feel this way. The, the T is thoughts. We, we have moments where we have a thought and then that thought leads to our emotion, and, and, and our emotion, our feeling, then generates a behavior or an action. So when we think certain things, it leads to feeling certain things, and then that actually leads us to then live out of that, that emotion and that thinking, which is huge, huge, huge when it comes to joy. In fact, uh, there's a proverb that says this. It says, as a man thinketh, so is he. Or as a woman thinketh, so is he. And, and, and what does that mean? You know what this means right here? This means that if you like wake up in the morning, you're like, man, it is gonna be a crappy day. It is gonna be a crappy day. Guess what? Guess, guess how your day is gonna go? It's gonna go crappy. It's gonna be not good. All right, if you, if you come into this space right here, tune in online and you, know, you say, hey, you know, church is irrelevant. You know, it, I, I'm not gonna get anything. It's boring. Guess what? You're probably gonna be bored. Even with some of the, the, the antics and the things we do to keep you engaged, like hitting golf balls. And you know, you know, you're probably going to, to, be, to be bored. If you come into this space and you say, man, I don't know what's gonna happen, but I'm excited. I'm gonna rejoice in God. I'm gonna see what he's doing. I, I believe he's gonna reveal something or do something in my life as a part of being in this experience. Uh, it may or may not go the way that you picture that, but I guarantee you, you're going to experience something. You're going to experience something because as a man or woman thinketh, so she is. A couple years ago, um, our family was out west traveling, and uh, we decided to take our kids to Yosemite National Park for a few days. It's amazing. I mean, we woke up to this view every single morning for like uh, four mornings, 
And uh, we'd been staying in the San Francisco area and like in Embassy Suites. And, and when we get to Yosemite, um, all they had available when we, we wanted to stay in the park were these things called housekeeping tents. And so we reserved one of these. And uh, our kids, just let me just say, most of them, they're less than and energetic and excited about it. All right. And so this one right here, she was kind of excited. Uh, this is a housekeeping tent right here. It, it's like a, a cinder block wall on three sides with a tent over the top and a tent door. All right. And, and so we're, we're kind of packing our stuff in here. And our... Most, you know, a few of our kids will remain nameless. We're like, really, this is what we're doing? Like, you brought us out here and thought this would be a good idea. And by the way, there are bears. They're they like bear boxes. You had to put your, anything that had a scent in a bear box. They're like, we're not going to sleep. You know, we're going to be, you know, up all night, afraid of the bears coming. And, you know, it's going to be a crappy time. And, and, you know, and so they were just like kind of bemoaning the whole thing. And so at some point, I don't know when it was, probably on the first day, Julie and I sat them down, had a family meeting. And we were like, listen, you know, here's the deal. If you think you're going to have a crappy time, you're going to have a crappy time. All right, if you think you're not going to sleep at all tonight, guess what? You're probably not going to sleep. Now, I'm not saying you're going to sleep the best on those beds right there, but I can guarantee you, if you think you're not going to sleep, you're going to wake, you're going to be up all night, you know, worried about when am I going to get to sleep? And so we're just like, listen, and by the way, we're paying like 150 and some odd dollars every night so you can stay in this tent. And so enjoy it. You need to enjoy it. That's what you need to do. <laughs> like you need to just enjoy this moment. And they were just kind of like, all right, so I guess we're not leaving. They thought that would get them a hotel, I think. You know, the craziest thing happened. You know, within like an hour, they discovered this bicycle. And, it, and the verdicts came out in our family. If I, I wasn't there when this happened, whether it got a note left on it or somebody dropped it off, the two of them disagree on like how this happened. But somebody said, hey, this is a bike we got given to us and we're leaving, so we're gonna pass it to you, use it, enjoy it. And then, you know, pass it on to somebody else. It was this old bicycle. And all of a sudden they started enjoying themselves. They started riding that thing around. They're racing around the campground. They were making trails and racetracks. And, you know, even into the night, I mean, they are buzzing by, you know, it's dark and there's my son, you know, going by our tent and they're hitting trash cans. I mean, just laughing and having a good time. And it's crazy because see, as a man or woman thinketh, so is he or she. You know, when it comes to golfing, I mean, you know, I used to play a lot of golf. I don't play nearly the kind of golf I used to play. And so um, I, I'm a little rusty, but I tell you what, when I step up to a, a shot now, if I step up and go, oh man, this is, this is gonna go horrible right here. Guess what? It is gonna be horrible every single time, all right? And it, it, but if I step up and I say, okay, I'm gonna nail this shot. I'm gonna nail this shot. I might nail it. I might shank it, all right? But, but I can guarantee you I'm gonna hit more better shots than less because as a man or woman thinketh, so he or she is. And see, it's interesting because a lot of times the way we think and the direction of our thinking leads us to where we are. You know, I've shared some over the last few months about kind of my personal story, how, you know, last couple of years have not been the best for me personally. And, you know, dealt with some depression I'd never experienced before. I'm not going to get into that story again. Um, but I want to tell you something about something that happened late last year. It was December, first week of December, and um, I started coming down sick one Tuesday afternoon. I was in the middle of prepping for the weekend, and I just got to the place where I couldn't even focus. I'm like, I can't even focus. I, my head hurts so bad. And I just laid down on the couch, put a bunch of blankets around myself, and pulled my hood over my head. And I must have fallen asleep for like three hours. My wife comes home, and she looks at me. She's like, what are you doing? And I'm like, I just, I'm freezing, and I can't get warm. And she's like, you're sick. I'm like, I think I am sick. I think I am. And I went to the doctor the next day, and, you know, she tested me, and, you know, sure enough, influenza A. And, and you know, I said to her, I said, I don't know how this happened. I got the flu shot, and she said, yeah, well, that, that's to keep you out of the hospital. It's doing its job. <laughs> I'm like, all right, good. And uh, she said, you know, you're probably going to gonna take, you know, five to seven days to run its course, and, 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 and that's kind of what it did. I mean, it, and it, was, it was painful. I mean, Every now and then somebody's like, oh, yeah, I had the flu too. I'm like, man, I, I don't, if, you, if you've not been in a place where you can't do anything, I mean, it, your skin hurts, your eyes hurt, it hurts to eat, drink, it, just to get touched, it hurts. I mean, that's the flu. And, and those five or six days when that was like at its, at its you know, kind of at its height, man, I tell you what, I, I just want to crawl in a hole and die. I mean, I really did. But then I hit about day seven and boom, all of a sudden it just shifted. And I'll never forget that, that day, that first day I started feeling better, I just remember going, oh my gosh, it feels so good to feel good. <laughs> it feels so good to feel good. 
And I don't think it was just the flu. It was almost like there was like God's spirit washed over me in that moment. And it was almost like, um, it, man, it just, it, even though you've kind of felt down you know, over the last number of months, man, it, it, just look at all the goodness around you. And maybe it was because I just felt so bad. I'm like, it feels so good to be good. And I realized in that moment, oh my gosh, maybe things are not as bad as I perhaps thought. You know, rejoice in the Lord always. You know, look around, pay attention, see what's going on around you. When, when am I to do that? All the time, all the time. Not just when things are going my way. And when I came out of that, I mean, there was just like a shift. It's like it just changed my direction. You know, last weekend, we talked about this word right here, um, repentance. And I want to I bring it up on the screen again. It's been a really interesting word for me lately. Um, a lot of us don't have a lot of good connection with it because of people who hold it on signs, you know, like downtown Indianapolis and, you know, scream and shout. And, you know, but this word is so fascinating. It's such a good word. I mean, it's, it's the Greek metanoia. Metanoia. Meta means to change. It, it means I'm, I'm going in this direction. I'm headed in this direction. Meta, I'm going to change. I'm going to change and go in a different direction. Noia uh, is, is actually where we get the word noggin. Um, you know, I'm going to change my noggin. I'm going to change my mind is what that means. So what that, that's what repentance is. Oh my gosh, you know, today's going to be horrible. Nothing's going to go well today. Oh, wait, stop. I'm, wait a second. That's not going to take me where I want to go. I need to change my mind. I need to think in a different direction. I need to repent and say, I'm sorry, oh my gosh, God, I'm so sorry that I was being so negative on that. I'm so sorry that, that I didn't turn my attention to you. I'm going to rejoice in you. I don't know how this is going to work out, but there's a lot of good stuff happening. I'm going to put my, my hope and my aspirations in you. And when I recognize that, and I see that I'm downward spiraling, and I see that, oh my gosh, I, my thoughts are getting the best of me, and I'm taking things personally, and, and maybe things aren't as bad as they could be. Oh my gosh, God, I need to say I'm sorry. I repent of that. Would you forgive me? I want to head in a new direction. I want to ask for your forgiveness. I want to change my mind, go in a new direction. Because see, when you change your mind, you actually end up in a different place. And I realized in that moment, man, I don't know that I've been rejoicing in the Lord. I don't know that I've been rejoicing in all the goodness that, that God brings around me. I mean, things have really been relatively well. And see, then Paul says this. He says, when you begin to do that, here's the result. Here's, here's what you experience. He says, in the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. The peace of God. When you say, okay, I'm going to rejoice in you, God, even when the circumstances aren't exactly what I want, your peace, the peace of God, is going to guard my understanding. Perhaps some of us have, have never experienced that. Maybe you've never received, you know, God into your life. Um, in fact, we could, let's just take a moment to, to perhaps do that right now. Maybe you want to pray to do that right now. I, I've got a couple more things I'm going to share with you. This isn't the end, but let's just bow our heads for a moment. Let's just close our eyes. Father, if there's any of us right now, they're just going, oh my gosh, um, Father, um, I want you, I want that kind of peace and that kind of joy in my life right now. I ask you, to, man, the, the moments where I begin to go down a direction and downward spiral, for, would you forgive me of those moments? I repent of those moments where, where I kind of do it my way and I miss the mark of the way you designed me to live. Would you just fill me right now with your peace and your joy and your spirit and, and help me to, 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 to just experience that? I want to I know that for the rest of my life. Amen. I mean, perhaps if you prayed that prayer for the first time, you just took a step or maybe a, a, a renewed a step to say, I, I want that, Jesus. So let's get back to where we started. For I can do all things, all things through Christ who strengthens me. <laughs> what does this have to do with joy and rejoicing? Well, here's what Paul says right before he gets to that. He, he says, I have learned in whatever situation I am in to be content and to know how to be brought low and to know how to abound. In each and every circumstance, I've learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. And then here's our phrase right here. For I can do all things in Christ who gives me strength. What he's saying is you can't be joyful until you are okay. And we learn to accept where we are right now. You know where the Apostle Paul is right now? He's in prison. That's where he's at. He's in prison. All right, he's in prison for his faith, in fact. Now, people in America don't go to prison for their faith, generally, um, but it, for Paul, he's in prison. He didn't do anything wrong in God's eyes, but he was in prison because he was living out his faith, and he says, I've learned the secret to contentment. I've learned the secret to joy. 
Now, it's interesting, because I've volunteered in prisons for a number of years. I used to be a part of a prison ministry. I'd go every Friday night to Pendleton Reformatory, spend Friday nights with these inmates. And, and what's crazy to me is when I would volunteer there, I would see these people in prison, guess, guess what? Think about this, more joyful than I see some of us when we're walking through the commons here at Cross Point. I'm like, wait a second, how can that be? These, these guys are in prison. Now, not all of them, all right? Some of them have really, really like sour ap- attitudes, but, but some of them, the ones that have this, this hope because they're rejoicing in, in who God is, they, they have this joy. And like, how can there be this joy on that side of the wall? Well, it's like Paul. Paul says in the extremes, I've learned to abound in every circumstance. I've learned to, the secret when I have plenty, when I have a lot of jack, as well as when I'm hungry. I, I've learned to, you know, be content when I have abundance, when I have a lot, when I have a lot, but also when I have need. How do you have joy and peace? when circumstances aren't exactly the way you want or when they're, when they're really, really good. Paul says, I can do all this. I can do all this because of Christ who gives me strength. See, this is the joy that he brings to us. And, and this is what he wants. He wants us to do things that, that cultivate that in our lives. He wants us to, I, I just thought I'd get a few more shots in because like, how many times do you get to do this in church? <laughs> Anybody want, to, anybody want a shot? Anybody want me to come in your way? Yeah, right here. All right, let me see if we can come your way. Here we go. He says, I want you to have, oh, like spot on. How about that? He says, I want you to, to have that kind of joy. Listen, I, I want the best for you. I really do. I want the best for you. Um, God wants the best for you. Um, the band's gonna come out. We're gonna do a song here as we kind of close. And, and, and one of the things we have to do is we have to stop listening to the narrative that our culture is actually always living out that tells you, hey, hey, you're alone. You are alone. You're very alone. Um, you know, listen, things are awful out there. Um, no, God, you're not alone. You have a heavenly father who knows exactly what's going on. You have a heavenly father who comes to this side of the equation. You have a heavenly father who provides for you. You, you have a heavenly father says, hey, be reasonable. When things aren't exactly going your way, look around. Pay attention to the bigger context. When, when you need a solution, you have a heavenly father. You can petition and say, okay, God, will you help me on this? And, and, and you will experience a joy that begins to pass our human understanding. That's what he wants for you.